Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Sister Maurice, and I approve this message. (laughs) And a little girl was saying her prayers one morning, and she was thanking God for the beautiful day. And her mother heard her, and she said, Honey, there's a blizzard outside. And the little girl said, Mommy, don't judge the day by the weather. (laughs) I've been praying that prayer sitting here this morning. (laughs) As Henry VIII said to each of his six wives, I won't keep you very long. (laughs) How are you? That Hawaii tells you I come from a place called the Bronx. (laughs) The Bronx is famous for a couple of things. Number one, the only people in the world who can say, I don't have an accent, are the people born and brought up in the Bronx. And the other thing about the Bronx, there are only two places in the world that have the in front of them. One is the Bronx, and the other is the Vatican. (laughs) And I'm associated with both of those places. I would like to thank each of you for coming to be with me on this, the most important day of my life. It's not my birthday. It's not the anniversary of anything in particular in my life. It's just simply the only day I have. And when people come to be with you at such a significant time in your life, you try to remember them. At least I do. And I'll try to remember you because you're here with me on this, the most important day of my life. I would like to thank Jill and Mary Kay, the members of the committee, for inviting me to come and share my experience, strength, and hope. It's nice to be invited. There was a time in my life when people stopped inviting me. I used to go anyway. day retreat, wondering why they didn't invite me back. So to be invited today, it's very, very special to me. We eventually arrived in Charleston. We won't go into that story. But I have a thing that says, if the plane lands safely, it was a good flight except ours took two days. (laughs) And we were met, we were met uh, by two lovely ladies, Karen and Jenna, and um, they were on assignment. They really didn't think they'd be driving from here to Charleston to pick Sister Rose and myself up. They didn't even know how to get there. (laughs) They weren't quite sure of how they were going to get us back. 
But I'm telling you, if you hang on to that amazing grace, it works just fine. And we had a marvelous and wonderful ride down here from the airport. We've had so many chauffeurs since we came here. We've had chauffeurs and navigators, and uh, I, uh, we were just so impressed with the uh, the cooks and the food and and all of that. I I'm always open to learning. I'm always open to learning, and I'm telling you, I learned so much this weekend about mayonnaise. <laughs> Since I was a little tot, I took mayonnaise for granted. <laughs> but I'm telling you, mayonnaise should be canonized and made a saint. <laughs> and there should be courses given about mayonnaise. And the professor should be Mary Kay. <laughs> I'm telling you, it, it was just, just remarkable what I learned about mayonnaise. <laughs> as far as our living conditions, Rose and I were talking about the beautiful home that we had for a matter of hours here. And I said to Rose, I said, you know, our bedroom was bigger than any convent we were ever stationed in. <laughs> it's been a remarkable experience for us. And, you know, it's one thing to say, let's have a convention, let's have a roundup, let's have a retreat, let's, and everybody says, yeah, let me know when it's going on. But the people who do the service, and if I fail to be grateful, I may lose the gift of having people like that. So again, I'd like to acknowledge the people on this committee. And, and all those who didn't know that they were going to be working this weekend. <laughs> until somebody said to them, get over there and do your service. I mean, it's just been a remarkable thing. And, and I think one of the things that's been very effective, and Mary Kay was asking us about this, I think is the size of the group. You know, I, I don't know how this would work out with a 1,000 people, but it works out just fine with this number, and it's been a marvelous and, and wonderful experience for us. Someone asked me one time, how do you feel, Maurice, when you're the last speaker at a convention? I don't do too many conventions. I receive a lot of invitations, but I have to say, no, God has assigned me elsewhere because I do retreats for people in recovery almost every weekend. Uh, but now and then I get to do a convention. And as I say, they usually have me as the Sunday morning speaker. And um, we have marvelous and wonderful speakers at these conventions, and I would like to acknowledge the wonderful speakers that we had at this one. And somebody asked me one time, how do you feel about being the last speaker? And I was reminded of a story I tell of when I was a senior in high school a few years back. <laughs> and uh, the last class for the week was Friday afternoon. And this priest would come in and talk to the senior girls. And he always began by saying, well... It's Friday afternoon. 
and they saved the good wine to last. Of course, his name was Monsignor Goodwine. <laughs> and I'm always reminded of, of that little story. It's Sunday morning, and some people bow their heads to pray, and some bow their heads to putt. And different things go on, different churches on Sunday morning. And the bishop was going around one time, visiting different parishes, and he was just about to offer mass when the priest came over and said to him, Bishop, could you wait a little bit because the mic's not working. We're getting the mic fixed. Uh, I was reminded of this story as we were waiting for the generator. So the bishop said, fine, don't worry, I'm fine. Let me know when the mic is fixed. So a little while later... Father came back and he said to the bishop, he said, uh, you could start mass now. The mic is fixed. So the bishop got up to the mic and he, he knew right away that the mic wasn't fixed. And so he yells, there's something the matter with this mic. And the congregation responds, and also with you. <laughs> One of our recent airport experiences, there were two elderly ladies, they were elderly, sitting in the airport, and they were crying and laughing, and they were having such a good time, and we were sitting not too far away from them. And with that, one says to the other, you know, we have been best friends since kindergarten. But you know, I, I don't know your name. What's your name? And the other one said, how soon do you need to know it? <laughs> <laughs> and then there were the two talking on the plane, two ladies, interesting conversation. One said to the other, my husband and I divorced over religious differences. He thought he was God and I didn't. <laughs> well, I, I taught first grade for a number of years and every once in a while I would think about going back, teaching first grade, but I changed my mind about that. But people send me things, and I know a lot of first grade teachers, and they collect things for me. This teacher was asking uh, her students in the first grade some things, and she said, what is a vacuum? And a little boy raised his hand, and he said, a large empty space where the Pope lives. <laughs> And another teacher asked her class, how do you keep milk from turning sour? And a little girl raised her hand and she said, keep it in the cow. <laughs> First grader came home from school and she said to her mother, mommy, we learned today how to make babies. And the mother was like blushing, and the mother said, interesting, how do you make babies? You just change Y to I and add ES. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I'll keep doing what I'm doing. I won't go back to first grade. If you don't remember anything I share this weekend, Please remember this. 
because this is how I want to be remembered. It's the most important thing about me at any point on a clock. I'm an alcoholic, which means one brandy, two brandies, three brandies, floor. <laughs> I'm a woman. I'm a member of a religious community. I'm an RN, a real nun. <laughs> I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous in good standing, in particular the Forest Hills group in Queens, New York. That's my home group. And the last thing I tell you about myself is my name. Incidentally, my name is Sister Maurice. One of the things I'm partial to in our fellowship is that it's a fellowship of equals. There are no titles in Alcoholics Anonymous. No one really cares what you do for a living. I love that expression, fellowship of equals. I don't think there's another outfit in society that can claim fellowship of equals like we can. At least we'd match any other group that's out there. And yet, you have never been anything else in this fellowship other than Sister Maurice. Isn't that a title? I see it as my name. It's on all my important papers. It's on my driver's license. It's the name I've been using most of my life. It's still written up quite well to police station, city of New York. <laughs> but moreover, it's the name that I gave to you when I came into your beautiful presence a while back now. A call had been made for me, and I was to go to the Forest Hills group of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I really wasn't quite sure that someone of my class and caliber should be going to such a place as AA. So I was not a happy camper when I came. But little by slowly, thanks to you, that has all changed for me. So much so that I can say quite comfortably today, I choose to live the AA way of life. For a few years I said, I have to go to AA, gotta go to AA, better go to AA. But you know what? I don't have to, gotta, or better. I choose to live the AA way of life. And when I talk about something being a way of life, it's not an incidental experience. It's not something I do when the spirit moves me. A way of life to me is as much a part of me as my right hand and my left hand. And that's the way I see Alcoholics Anonymous today. But for starters, I went to this first meeting. I went up the stairs, down the stairs, into a little room. There was one man in the room. He took a look at me, came running across the room, grabbed my hand, told me who he was, and then he said, what's your name? I said, me? He said, yeah, what's your name? Well, I said, I'm Sister Maurice. Now, this man didn't say to me, We'll have a group conscience meeting and I'll get back to you. <laughs> the very next thing the man said was, hi, Sister Maurice, you're welcome. And in my over 35 years in the fellowship, no one has even suggested that I call myself anything else. The name is important, it's mine. But the most important thing about me, at any point on a clock, is what I told you first and foremost. I'm an alcoholic. And each and every time I say that, beginning first, when I awaken in the morning, I don't know how you sleep. Of course I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I sleep primarily on my right side. And when I awaken in the morning, I don't even know I have two eyes because this one's buried in the pillow. Before I go looking for this eye, 
The very first thing I do, I announce before my God, I am an alcoholic. It sets the tone here, puts me on the right wavelength. And any time thereafter that I say I'm an alcoholic, I am reminded that of all the things I do each day that God gives me, my most important work, job, task, assignment is that I stay sober. And I do that best through the principles and traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous as they have been written. When I came a while back, you gave me a book. And you called it big. I thought it was an interesting way you described the book. The lady who gave it to me, she was much shorter than I was, and she stood out in front of me, and she held the book in two hands, and she said, here is a big book. <laughs> no coincidence, I'm very far-sighted, and I saw some fellows over there putting some shiny signs on the wall. And my eye hit upon the one that said, keep it simple. And as sick and all as I was, I said to myself, wouldn't dare say it to the lady, boy, do these people practice what they preach. <laughs> can't get much simpler than that. Here is a big book. <laughs> of course, now we have the paperback, which I call the small big book. <laughs> I don't call it the small book. I don't call it the little book because there's another book in the bookstore in the mall called the small book. And it talks about being an alternative to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I call ours the small, big book. Well, you introduce anything new in AA, they send for you. <laughs> <laughs> and this fella came to me, and he had a small, big book, and he's pacing up and down. He's saying, hey, sister, you call this the small, big book? I said, I do. He said, that's a contradiction. I said, what do you mean, contradiction? He said, small, big, small, big. <laughs> I thought for a moment and I said, well, we have had jumbo shrimp for years. <laughs> if you didn't get that, you could talk to your sponsor. <laughs> from you, the one that you called big, and this is what you said to me. You told me I should read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I should study the big book. I should believe what I found there. I should share what I believe, and I should practice what I share. And then you suggested I do that along with the people who know how to do it best. And you called that outfit the fellowship. And then you put the whole thing together and you said to me, that is a design for living that really works. What do I know about anything? I said, let me see what I can do. And that design for living has worked so well for this lady here that I don't spend the fleeting moment of my precious time looking around for alternative ways to go. I need all the help I can get, believe you me, but it is always as a secondary measure to the program. Alcohol became a way of life for me in a very short period of time. It dictated my moods, it made my decisions, it said you will and it said you won't. I found it very hard to eventually surrender to the fact that whenever the first drink, I thought maybe the 21st, but whenever the first drink of alcohol would go into this body, mind, and spirit, two things happened. One, I didn't know how many more I was going to have. Two, I didn't know what the behavior would be like. 
However, if you met me along the way in those days and you said, sister, how many drinks did you have or will you have? I would have said two, because that's what a lady should have. <laughs> and if you said to me, what was your behavior like or what will it be like? I would have said steady as you go, because that's how I saw myself. But I know today it was very different. I was a first grade teacher at the time. And I had the reputation in those days of being the best teacher in the school. When the children came to first grade after Labor Day each September, by the end of September, my kids were ready for college. <laughs> so at 10 o'clock in the morning, I'd be working real hard with these kids, and something would start in my body, mind, and spirit. It would be screaming in there, you need a drink. And the very next thing I would do morning after morning, I'd put up against the screaming what people told me I had so much of, and that was willpower. And the willpower approach was futile. And I went on to learn, and I'm glad I did, that it wasn't that I was a weak-willed individual, but rather I was a diseased person. I was a sick, untreated alcoholic. And when you are in that condition, it goes beyond the strength of your will to do other than to satisfy what's going on in there. So I'd move to the next phase of the game plan. And I'd say, well, it's a couple of minutes after 10. These kids can go out to the bathroom. Then they can have their snack. Get the teacher next door to keep an eye on them, because I'm a responsible teacher. And then I'll run over to the convent, get a drink, be back when this is all over. I'd be running across the yard to the convent, and this would be my thought. This is going to be my last drink, at least until I've done my day's work. Uh, I was too sick to recall in those days that at 5 a.m., when the big bell went off to get us into our day, uh, my story goes back to old God's time before we went mod. <laughs> and we had this bell that went off at 5 a.m. And for me to get into anything in those days, I had to reach over from my bed and take that drink. And every morning that I would do it, I would say, this is going to be my last one, at least until I've done my day's work. So whenever I would take the first one, everything would center around, when am I going to get the next one? And yet, if you met me along the way in those days and you said, sister, who or what is the center of your life? I would have been insulted by the question. You just called me sister. You see how I'm dressed, every piece from stem to stern. You just saw me come out of that building called convent. And you're asking me who's the center of my life? How come you don't know the center of my life is God? And I would have been insulted by the question. Today, I choose to live honestly as best I can, thanks to you. And I have no problem in sharing. Somewhere along the line, the focus in my life shifted. And it shifted from God to that next drink. And I justified the use of alcohol in my life. I might say, too, because maybe someone needs to hear it. It was not one of my goals in life to become an alcoholic. I do not recall getting up a dark and gloomy day, a bright and sunny day, saying, today's the day, Alki, by six tonight, I'll destroy me and see how many I can take with me. I do not see alcoholism as self-inflicted. I believe it is a sickness, disease, condition that comes to a person. I think it's a marvelous and wonderful idea that we have steps that suggest to us that in God's time we make amends because we are accountable. But I don't hold myself responsible for the sickness that came to me. However, I hold myself very, very, very responsible for the precious life-giving gift of sobriety that has been given to me. 
I did not get sober. I tried to get sober. I couldn't pull it off. I don't believe a person can get sober. That's my opinion. I believe something bigger, greater outside of the person takes place. They call it a miracle. And I believe the precious life-giving gift of sobriety is given. And I believe it's given by one bigger, greater than all of us put together. I choose to call that one God. So I feel very responsible to take care of the precious life-giving gift of sobriety that God has given me. So much so that I have no problem in sharing with you. If you should ever hear that Maurice is back drinking, please, please, don't call me a victim. Call me a volunteer. And the very next thing you should say, somewhere along the line, she wasn't willing to do everything necessary to stay sober. I cannot plead ignorance today. You have taught me and taught me well how to take care of the precious life-giving gift of sobriety each day that God gives me. Going back to the scene in the bed with the eye in the pillow, the second thing I do each morning before I go looking for the eye, I pray the Lord's Prayer. And when I reach the part of the prayer that says, give us this day our daily bread, I emphasize the word daily because I want to remind myself, I will have sufficient bread, sufficient help for the day. He will not refuse anyone who asks for the bread for the help, but he gives it a day at a time. It's my responsibility then to take the bread, the help, and to use it to take care of the gift of sobriety for the rest of that day. There are advantages to years of sobriety. I've had them. But as the years of sobriety increase, so do the perils of smugness. Complacency is a killer. The little sheep that strays from the flock is usually the one that's found in the ditch over the embankment, hanging from a barbed wire fence. A favorite fruit of mine is a banana. And every time I eat a banana, I have a meditation. And the meditation is, the banana that leaves the bunch is the one that gets skinned. <laughs> I have a drunkalogue that tells you quite well that all by myself, I can stay very sick and quite drunk. But I truly believe I cannot stay sober and fairly well without you. Well, how do you really know that, Maurice? You've never left us. When God was giving out ears, I thought he said beers. <laughs> and I said two large ones. I am an excellent listener to the sharing of other people. I was affected physically, mentally, spiritually, socially, emotionally from this disease. Physically, I fared out pretty well. There were times I tried to arrange my own physical death. I used to take the car, leave the Bronx, go across the George Washington Bridge, up the Palisades Parkway, pull over where you could sightsee, and I would say, when those cars are gone, when those folks are gone, I'm going to run this car over the embankment because I don't know what's the matter with me. And then I'd have what I call today a moment of amazing grace. And I'd say, I'll go get a drink. I'll come back and do this another time. So I was not to die physically. But there are other ways of dying. I'm sure you can identify. I suffered the death of my values. I suffered the death of my integrity. I suffered the death of everything I stood for as a woman, everything I stood for as a sister. All those areas of my life died. Outwardly, I looked pretty good, held a job, did it fairly well, tried to keep up with my responsibilities. And above all, above all, I always said my prayers. No matter what shape I was in, I was always praying away. 
And some of you have shared with me along the way that you thought you missed the boat because you didn't pray enough. Listen, I prayed enough for you and all belonging to you. <laughs> so this disease is so big that something as powerful as prayer will not take it away. I don't believe you can just pray your way through alcoholism. I don't believe you can just pray your way through the effects of alcoholism on the other side of the coin. And yet we say, where would we be without prayer? Prayer is a path where there is none. But I think for folks like you and me, there's another piece that goes with the prayer. I describe it this way. Pray and row the boat. And this beautiful way of life, this design for living, enables us to pray and to row the boat. I denied that alcohol was my problem. I was somewhat relieved when I learned that denial is the major presenting symptom of alcoholism. And when you're in denial with this disease, you are not in touch with reality. What I knew about my situation would fit on a postage stamp. What was happening in my life was as big as the state of South Carolina. But if I didn't have it up here when it was presented, then it didn't happen. Now, I had hundreds of people talk to me about my drinking and the behavior that went with it. The nerve of that one coming in here and telling me how much I drank and what I was saying and doing. You know, I wasn't even in that room. And there were many times that I exercised the denial. My mother was in the hospital in New York City having a total hip operation. She was there for months and months and months. The operation wasn't as perfected then as it is today. Now I think they do it going up and down in the elevator. <laughs> I went every single day to be at my mother's bedside because that's where a good daughter should be. And one day, my beautiful mother, beautiful Irish, soft-spoken lady, she said to me in a whisper, if you don't come tomorrow, it'll be just fine. You must have a lot of work to do around the convent and the school. Why don't you skip a few days? And I sat there thinking, wow. There she is with all her pain, and she's thinking of me. But see, I know today, because I'm in touch with reality, thanks to you, that my beautiful mother could not bring herself to say, you're an embarrassment to me. You're no help to me. I don't need you around this hospital drunk. Now, I have just one sister, and she's also a sister, but I don't call her sister, but yet she's my sister. If you don't get that, you could see me later. <laughs> and during my act of alcoholism, my sister secretly wished she joined a missionary community and lived in Mexico. It is very hard to be proud of a sick, untreated alcoholic. I, I know that today. I didn't know it then. Well, my sister came to the hospital to visit my mother. She gave me one of those come outside the door kind of winks. I dutifully went outside. I figured she needs my advice, my opinion. My sister is very tall. She towers over me. And like my mother, she's a beautiful, soft-spoken lady. And in a whisper, she says to me, why? Why would you come to this hospital at 4 o'clock in the afternoon drinking? I was just about to give her a lecture when it dawned on me, we've been down this road a hundred times before. To the best of my recollection, not a word did I speak. But being a typical alcoholic, and that's all that I am, typical alcoholic, couldn't let well enough alone. You know one of our songs, first you say you will and then you won't, you know. I took my right hand, the more powerful of my two, and I belted her. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, two nurses came running down the hall and they are yelling, sisters, sisters. <laughs> they were not calling us sisters because we were related by blood. 
But we would dress like sisters used to dress. Some still dress today. My veil was on the floor. Hers was someplace else. <laughs> now, I learned a few years later that one of the major rules in this hospital is that no patient leaves their room unescorted. They were coming out crutches, wheelchairs, all fours, because the word got around quickly. There were two nuns out there killing one another. <laughs> now, in the midst of this chaos, I had a couple of concerns. Interesting enough, I did not have the concern. Maybe I shouldn't have belted her. I did not have the concern. Maybe I shouldn't have had the last drink before I came down here. My major concern as I'm looking up at my sister is, why did she scream? That's how we got this hoop de doo here. Well, do you know I look back with a sober, clear head? Do you know it's perfectly normal? You belt someone, they let out a hoop. The other concern I had, my purse had fallen onto the floor, making a rather loud sound as it fell to the floor. I was a little distracted with the purse. I wasn't too concerned about the few dollars in the purse. I have a vow of poverty. I kept it quite well during this time. <laughs> but I was very concerned about the pint of holy water in the purse. <laughs> One pint of Christian Brothers brandy. Brandy, not whiskey. I was concerned about the pint of Christian Brothers brandy that was in the purse. And what is the thinking of a sick, untreated alcoholic? No one leaves here with that purse other than you know who. Now, there's only one word to describe somebody who'd be in that position. And I had to go through a lot of other descriptions before, with your help, I could get to what's proper, right, and fitting. And if there's anyone in this gathering who still sees themselves in this first group, I would suggest you leave that thinking here today because it doesn't apply. I had to go through bad, hopeless, weak-willed, sinner, you should know better, but the way I would describe someone today would be sick, unwell, not playing with full deck. <laughs> <laughs> or I heard a fellow one night at a meeting, he described himself, he said he was a quart low. <laughs> I heard another fellow another night, he said he had a photogenic mind. He just never had any film in the camera. <laughs> well, I had to go ways before I could see myself as sick and unwell. If you drink and you drive, you might miss the mark. I was always behind the wheel of a car. It was an insult to show on your face that you would drive us home. I brought you there, I bring you home. And you know, as sick and all as I was, it never ceased to amaze me. We'd have the big to-do about the fact that I shouldn't be driving. I'd get in behind the wheel, and they'd all get in the car. <laughs> Thank God for beautiful Al-Anon. My first accident, July of 70, my dear friend, Sister Rose, Rose was in court over the dismissal of a teacher from her school. This was a big case in the diocese at that time. She had a prominent lawyer appointed by the diocese, and I said, I'll be in court to help the lawyer help Rose. <laughs> How do we affect the people on the other side of the coin? The night before the trial, Rose called me up and she said, Maurice, please, don't come to court. My thinking was, wow, there she is with all her pain, and she's thinking of me. <laughs> but I've heard Rose share her beautiful Al-Anon story and indeed she was thinking of herself and rightly so it was not my style to push I said you know what Rose you'll have a lot of paperwork to do I'll go to my classes I'll meet you downtown at lunchtime you can brief me and I'll advise you for the afternoon session and to be rid of me she said fine well I was in graduate school that summer 
And I drove well fortified from the top of the Bronx to the Wall Street section of my city. It was five minutes after 12 lunchtime, a working day in Wall Street, and the weather was clear. Those are the things they tell you at the top of the police report. <laughs> it's, important, it's important for our situation to know the weather. A United States mail truck that was parked by the curb, minding its own business, got in my way. And I smashed into it. And when the policeman came on the driver's side, first word out of his mouth, he couldn't miss it. He said, sister. I was a little taken back by the next part. He didn't say, sister, are you hurt? Could I call someone? You think women will ever be ordained? <laughs> he said, sister, could you have been drinking? I wondered how the guy got on the police force. <laughs> As was my style, officer, could I help you? I proceeded to tell the officer about my friend who was in court, how upset I was, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I went into a blackout, eventually a pass out. I woke up in a convent a short distance away. I woke up in a strange bed. Half my clothes on, half my clothes off. I'm looking around. Where am I? What happened? How did I get there? What is this place? It was not my custom then, certainly not my custom today, to wake up in strange beds. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm around long enough to know that you have your story, but um, <laughs> I always woke up in my own bed. But at a time like that, we all have the same tricks of the trade. Where am I? What happened? How do you get out of here? I put that game plan into operation, and I heard some voices through a partially open door. So I tiptoed over to the door. I was so glad the door was partially open that I didn't have to squeak it. Because, you know, we may be sick, but we're not stupid. We don't go over, throw the door open, and say, what the heck happened? <laughs> you go over, you put an eye out and an ear out because you hear voices. See if you could pick up a little something to go on because you know from previous experiences they will be questioning you when you don't know anything. So I peek out, and I see Rose. And I knew as long as Rose was there, everything was going to be fine. She had such nice things to say about me, and she was always praying. And she just quietly went about her rounds. The other sister, neither of us knew the lady. She was at least seven feet tall, and she was like a lunatic. And I got to the door as the big, tall lady is screaming at Rose. Your friend is on pills or she's drinking. And in order to help her, you are going to have to hurt her. I thought that was poor advice. <laughs> so I took the eye and the ear in, went back to bed to get a little rest to handle Rose, who came in and asked the going question in our lives at that time. What happened? I told it as I saw it. I lost control of the car because I was so upset about the court case. Now, in those days, the car was in my mother's name. My mother didn't know about the accident. I had the car fixed, back out on the road. Three weeks had passed. Every time you talked to Rose, when are we going to tell your mother about the accident? Never! <laughs> Why do you want to tell my mother? The car's in her name. So what? The car's fixed. Then the fears that set in for the sick, untreated alcoholic. What if Rose tells your mother? So I called Rose up, invited her out for supper, my treat, <laughs> took her to a little restaurant, leaned across the table in the restaurant and said, if you dare to tell my mother about the accident, someday you will come out of your convent. I'll be sitting in a car, and when you cross the street, that will be it. <laughs> <laughs> that is called threatening someone's life. <laughs> Now, I always shared that in my story, and one night, 100 years ago now, means a long time, I was speaking someplace, and we had a friend at the meeting. She's not in program. She came to hear me speak. So at the end, she comes up to me, and she says, do you really think you would have run over Rose? You know, up to that moment, no one had ever asked me that question. Not even Rose. <laughs> 
I said, let me tell it to you this way. Of myself, no. I, I wouldn't hurt a fly. As a little tot, teenager, young adult, in the convent a hundred years, you never knew I was around. I was always hiding out. What did I have to offer? I'm a nothing. I wouldn't harm you. But you know, you put one drink in here. The first one. And you can paint the most tragic scene you can think of. And I could be the one heading it up. And I always like to point out, because sometimes people say, well, you know, Maurice, we know you're an alcoholic, but, you know, you're a nun, you know. I always like to point out, it wasn't that I was at Mass the next morning or that I was reading one of the 10,000 religious books that I had in those days. And the thought came to me, oh, you shouldn't kill Rose. That isn't what happened for me. You know what happened? It was another moment of that amazing grace. It just wasn't to be part of my story or part of Rose's that I would run her over. And I also like to point out that after over 35 years of continuous sobriety, you put one drink in here the first one. And you can paint the most tragic scene you can think of and I could be the one heading it up. I don't know another disease, sickness, condition like this one. How blessed are we to have been called into a way of life where you can keep that kind of a situation in check and get on and be that person that God created you to be. How blessed are we to have beautiful Al-Anon to be called into that where you can deal with the effects of that and get on and be that person that God created you to be. How blessed are we. However, if I fail to be grateful, I may lose the gift. But if I'm truly grateful, I will take care of the gift. Well, the disease was moving along, and one day I got a call from my boss. Now, in those days, I got a call from the big boss, who in those days was in the same category as the Pope. You never heard from the big boss. If she called you personally, it was for either of two reasons. One, you were in trouble, or there was a special assignment that only you could do. So I'm driving up to see the boss, and this is my thinking. I have enough to do. <laughs> we get there we have a little chit chat she says Maurice I'll get to the point some of the sisters are saying that you drink too much now in those days you wouldn't dare ask a question I asked a question I stuttered when I asked it but I asked it I said well, well where are they she got a little nervous because I guess no one ever asked her a question and she said oh they don't want to be mentioned and you know, in a very sick and negative way, I, I, I would not recommend this to anyone. I was into one of our steps at that moment, but in a very sick and negative way. Made a list. <laughs> of all people who had harmed me and asked God to be rid of them. <laughs> well, I asked her another question. I said, do you really know anything about me? Because in those days, there was a gap between the big boss and the rest of us. We had all these other bosses and whatever. She said, well, I have a file. She went over and she peeked in and she said, oh, I didn't know. You're going to get your master's degree and you just got this award. And there were trophies all over the place. She closed the file and she said, Maurice, I will never, ever again believe this about any of our sisters. I said, that's a good policy to follow. She gave me an apology, and off I went. And I walked back to the car. I had one thought. She will never, ever, ever send for me again. And she never did. The next time she arrived unannounced and put me away. <laughs> so when I learned about denial... I like to keep things simple. Alcohol makes the alcoholic feel fine. Yada, yada, you, 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 you. 
Therefore, he or she thinks everything is fine. Meanwhile, the people looking on are saying, oh, here we go again. When I learned that, it helped me immensely. I was angry and resentful during this time, angry with God. I'd given my life to God. What more do you want? I love the word relationship. You've been my teachers about relationships. Prior to recovery, as a little tot, I put a game plan in place, trying to relate to this God, whoever or whatever he was. I don't just come from an Irish Catholic family. I have another dimension. We call it Bic, Bronx Irish Catholic. <laughs> and they were always talking about going to hell and God's going to get you and you're not going to go to heaven and you're bad and you better say your prayers and go to church. So as a little tut, I said to myself, look good at do something. So I put a game plan in place, trying to relate to this God, whoever or whatever he was. And I continued the game plan all the way into the convent some years later. It went like this. I sat up straight. I knelt up straight. I disciplined myself. And we didn't have the expression in those days, but the expression that would have applied, been there, done that. And then when I was drinking, it was taking God on. If you don't need me, well, I don't need you. Well, if I don't need someone bigger, greater, outside of this lady here, I wonder who I think I am. So I was angry and resentful with God. I was depressed during this time. I was in the convent many years before I picked up alcohol. Didn't like taste of alcohol, didn't use alcohol. On the 5th of January, 1967, my beautiful father, Maurice, he went to God. And upon his death, when he looked eyeball to eyeball into the eyes of God, at that moment is perfection for anyone, I believe. And I believe whatever you lack, you will receive at that moment. And that's how my father received sobriety. He died of alcoholism at the age of 58. And I buried my father, and I went way inside. And shortly thereafter, I came out with a drink in my hand. And I can say quite comfortably today, my father and myself were carbon copies of one another with one big difference. The way we were to receive the precious life-giving gift of sobriety. So I was using alcohol to lift me out of a depression. I was getting more depressed. In the bargaining stage, one bargain I like to share on. I got into bed one night, had my rosary beads praying away, hanging onto the sheets with the other hand, and I'm no sooner in the bed and I have to get up and get a drink. And I said to God, you know what? I don't want to drink anymore tonight. Please help me. I'll, I'll do more work for you and for your people. Please don't let me drink anymore tonight. They'll see the first drink of the day. Always has the final say, and of course we had had that, so the covers get pushed back and... The, Prayer beads go to the floor, and you get up, and you find your hiding spot, you get your bottle, and you do something you don't want to do, you take another drink. And after I took that drink, I beat that floor, and I doubted the existence of God. How could a God who loved me? I just asked you to help me. I'll bet there's no God. I live in downtown Manhattan, right in the heart of New York City, and I drive on the when I'm in town, I drive on the FDR Drive, the East River Drive, and I see our brothers and sisters, yours and mine. They're on both sides of the highway. They build their homes there out of cardboard boxes and crates, and you see them frying an egg, and they need a jacket and a pair of shoes. And they have little brown bags. I only had one kind of brown bag with my bottle in it. They have that kind and other kinds. And if those folks, our brothers and sisters, went over to the guardrail and beat the guardrail and doubted the existence of God, we'd say, poor socks. What do they got going for them? I'm in a beautiful convent at the time. I want for nothing. And alcohol brought me to the point where I doubted the existence of God. As we say in here, whether you come from Yale or jail, Park Avenue, Park Bench. What does it matter where you came from? Oh, I think it's important to get to know your history, your story, but I put more energy into where do we go from here? Whatever happened this morning, yesterday, a week ago, a year ago, or a hundred years ago, you have taught me to learn from the experience, but not to let it stand in the way of putting one foot 
in front of the other and being that person that God created you to be. And the other thing I did that night, I cried out at the top of my lungs, isn't there anybody anywhere who knows what I'm going through? Because each one in the throes of the sickness, whether you are afflicted with the disease like me or affected by the disease like Rose, each one thinks nobody, nobody knows what I'm going through. It's a lonely sickness. Well, I didn't know you were up the street and down the road and over the hill and across the town and over the bridge going through the same thing, but I'm mighty glad that somewhere along the way God saw fit that we would find one another in this beautiful fellowship, and it is God who has arranged our meeting. I truly believe that. C.S. Lewis, you heard of him. He says in one of his writings about relationships, he talks about relationships in general, And he says, it's as if God says to the people in the relationship, you have not chosen one another, but I, God, have chosen you for one another. If you think of the relationships that you have in the fellowship, would you of yourself have chosen those people? Maybe yes, maybe no. I like to think it was arranged. (laughs) Like happened at the gatehouse in Akron, Ohio, with Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob. And do you want to know about the grace of God? Do you know as a result of that arranged relationship, that's how we get to be here this morning? It's really something when you put it all out there and reflect on it. Well, today I make bargains, deals, promises, commitments, and I follow through. I attribute that to one fact and one fact only. I don't drink alcohol while I'm sober. Very significant in Maurice's life. (laughs) And the final stage is acceptance. The disease was moving along, and finally it all came to a head because I had two exceptional do-gooders in my life. My sister and Rose. And keeping it simple, they snitched. (laughs) They blew the whistle and turned me into the boss that I had charmed a few months before. They brought the boss to my mother's where I was hiding out. I noticed a difference in the boss. She wasn't interested in anything I had to say. And she's talking past tense. She's saying things like, arrangements have been made. And they're expecting you in Lutheran General Hospital in Park Ridge, Illinois. I listened. She said you could go Friday or Saturday. I listened. Then she said you'll be there for 28 days. And all of a sudden, way in here, I said to myself, I won't be there for 28 minutes. And then she said, there you will find out what is wrong with you. And way in here. I said to myself, there isn't anything wrong with me. But you know, as sick and all as we are, we are not stupid. And I knew the only way I was going to get out of the room and away from the three people was to say, I'll go. I said, I'll go. I'll go Saturday. So I went out on an AA plane, American Airlines, the way I do like to go. (laughs) And I met 64 charming men and women like you. And the word got around quickly. We have this Catholic sister in treatment. We have this nun. And one by one, the 64 came to me. And they all did the same thing. They beat up on themselves. They said terrible things about themselves. And they always finished by saying, you know, sister, this is a mistake for you. You shouldn't be in a place like this. You're not like me. Well, believe you me, anyone who thinks like I do, they're going to be my friend. I had a nifty getaway plan. I scrapped it. I'm not one who sits around idle. Do you know by the end of the first week, I was a therapist. (laughs) And the word got around quickly. You don't like your counsel. You don't like your group. Talk to sister. Now, every day at 1 o'clock, we had what they call free time. Well, I don't know if you remember those 28-day programs. They put big capital letters, free time. And under it, this is what you'll do with it. No. We were supposed to stay in our room, read, write, listen to tapes. I always did as I was told. We had a nice table, tape recorder, pens, books. I'd block out what happened yesterday. I'd be there two minutes each day at one o'clock. And I'd take the table and I'd throw it clear across the room. 
and I'd go to the wall behind. I'd bang my head against the wall, yelling and screaming at God, why me? I've been so good, and this is what you've done to me. My roommate had run out. She'd say she's at it again. <laughs> There'd be blood pouring out of my head. They'd come in, clean me up, calm me down. I'd be fine till the next day at 1 o'clock. I was too sick then and long before that time to hear God say, you don't have to be good. You are good. That's a given. No one has been deprived of that goodness. Well, where does the bad come in? Oh, it's there. That's attitude. That's behavior. I try, keyword try, to separate attitude and behavior from the person I try, keyword try, to separate attitude and behavior from this lady here, and I continue to chip away at my attitude and my behavior through that beautiful process of recovery, and I do it along with folks like you, and while the process continues, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, I walk very tall. I cannot help but be impressed at the goodness and holiness that sits and stands in this room. And if you're not there yet, borrow from me till you get your own strength. You don't have to be good. You are good. A marvelous and wonderful man, a marvelous and wonderful woman And we talk about spirituality quite a bit, people like you and me. We talk about a spiritual program that we have. You want to know the key to the spiritual? It's getting in touch with your own goodness. And the world has missed the boat with that. How blessed are we to have been called into a way of life where you can chip away at your stuff through that beautiful design for living and do it along with the other folks. And little by slowly, perhaps, take your rightful place and walk tall and be who you are. And any time you ask that question, and it's a frequent question that we ask, you know, who am I? Who the heck am I? Please go one more step. Oh, yes, I'm a marvelous and wonderful woman. I'm a marvelous and wonderful man. Thank you, God. It's key to the spiritual. Well, some 35 years and just a little short way from, please God, 36 years. I have a why me question of God. Not why me, God. Why am I an alcoholic? But why am I sober since most people don't receive this gift? And the reason I ask it frequently, I do not want to take sobriety for granted. I do not want my attitude to be big deal, sober, 35 years, a day at a time. What else is new? I want to stay in touch with the gift. So I God, tell me again, why am I sober? And he answers very loud and very clear. And he says the same thing all the time. He says, Maurice, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. The big book says God did for him what he could not do for himself. And he says many are called to the disease of alcoholism. Many are called to the condition on the other side of the coin. Very few are chosen for the precious life-giving gift of sobriety, for the precious life-giving gift of recovery in Al-Anon. And I say, well, why me, God? And he says, make your little chart. I make a little chart. I headed alcoholism. I put a simple line down the center. I put on this side of the chart, all of us in recovery around the world. AA, Al-Anon combined. We put on this side of the chart all those who are still out there. You wouldn't even see us. I find it awesome to be on that side of the chart. And I don't want to take it for granted. So I do the why me. Well, okay, God, I'm on that side of the chart. Why me? And he says, Maurice, how do you see death? A hundred years ago now, that means a long time I sat with death. What is death all about? What is God doing? I was just meditating on death. 
And I read a line that I had read many times before, but this time I had a moment of amazing grace. The line is, there's a time to be born. There's a time to die. And that's on God's calendar. And I believe any person goes to God in death, regardless of age or circumstances, when their work here on earth is finished. I do not see the God of my understanding as a yo-yo. Well, I'm taking that one, I'm leaving those three, and I'm getting that. No, I see God 24 hours a day. He wants top top shelf, the very best for us. But your work is finished. I may have more work for that person to do, but on God's calendar, their work is finished. And the other thing that helps me, I'll see those people again when my work is finished. Well, the point, untreated alcoholism is still listed as an ultimate terminal condition, 100% fatal. And here we are. Well, I believe our death has been interrupted because our work's not finished. There'll be tragedy in our world tonight. Some people will go to God, their work is finished. Others will be saved, their work is not finished. Those who are saved, I don't know what their work is. More will be revealed to them. I believe ours is defined. It's a specialized work. With all due respect to the church, the medical profession, other forms of help, they do a lot for us. But you know what? There's just something about one alcoholic sharing with another alcoholic, one member of Al-Anon sharing with another member of Al-Anon. Just something special about that. So my major assignment on any given day And I take the liberty of saying, I believe yours is the exact same as mine. My number one assignment on any given day is to take care of the precious life-giving gift of sobriety, to carry a message, walk with, pass it on, be the fellowship. Many ways to carry a message. Pontificating at a podium is one way. Since we got off the airplane on Friday, we were to come on Thursday. And we saw the two beautiful ladies, and they weren't even talking. Beginning there, the message was being carried, and has been carried throughout this weekend. And some people weren't even saying anything. That's why we're called the program of attraction rather than promotion. I'm proud to be a sober, recovering alcoholic woman, practicing a day at a time this design for living. Well, very late in the fourth week at this facility, The 27th and a half day of the 28-day program, something happened for me. (coughs) When I got up that morning, there was something different about me. I was crying and laughing and shouting, I'm really an alcoholic. Because up to that time, I was going through the motions because I'm getting out of here in 28 days. And I went to see my one-on-one counselor at the facility, a beautiful Lutheran minister. And I said to him, Reverend, Reverend, I'm really an alcoholic. And he got so excited, and he did something that he never did in any of our sessions. He started dancing around the room. (laughs) And he said, I have a prescription for you to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you're faithful to that prescription, you will only have to return here as our guest. I said, I won't make any promises. I'll see what I can do. And by that amazing grace of God, as it operates in rooms like this, and my cooperation with the grace, another way of saying that, we know the program works, but if you don't work the program, it doesn't work for you. So by my doing my part, I haven't found it necessary to pick up a drink or any substitute since April 17th. 1971. I am not one who says I will never drink again. 
If I thought I would never drink again, perhaps I wouldn't be as faithful. Early this morning, I asked for daily bread. We'll see how tomorrow goes. So I came into the rooms, I did the old one too. Didn't drink, went to meetings, went to meetings, didn't drink. Didn't drink, went to meetings, went to meetings, didn't drink. Always sitting there waiting for this thing to be finished. But they weren't going to say I wasn't there. And one night I heard a fellow share. And this is what he said. He learned unless he put the 12 suggested steps into his life and made some changes, he could very well lose his sobriety. And I sat up real tall, put a little smirk on my face because I was sure he was going to say, we don't mean that for the little sister there in the third row. (laughs) And he never said it. And with the help of people like you, I learned why I was so miserable. Oh, I heard you say, change or die. I used to poke the one next to me and say, isn't there something in between? (laughs) No. To be stuck would be a luxury. We're always in motion. We're changing or we're dying. We're getting well or we're going back. No big deal, though. Don't make a big deal, please. We have a beautiful process. Marvelous and wonderful folks to walk with us. And my responsibility before God, I'll try. God blesses effort. My responsibility is to try. And so little by slowly, change started to happen and continues to happen right up to this moment because I continue to be a student of the principles and traditions. And I do it along with folks like you. And the three changes that started over 35 years ago and continue right now are in three categories. The first had to do with the intellect. When I came to you, it was my way or no way. It was ready, fire, aim. It was postage stamp thinking, and we talked about that. And this is what you said to me. You said, Maurice, give yourself some time. Work your steps to the best of your ability, and don't go it alone. It'll do wonders for your head. And I took the suggestion, and I've had what I call up here an intellectual conversion. And then the moral conversion. I lost my value system. That bothered me terribly. And we talked about that. And you said, Maurice, work your steps to the best of your ability. Don't go it alone. And little by slowly, I was able to get first things first and second things second. And when wrong, promptly admit it. And practice the principles in all my affairs. You even taught me how to practice the principles And you won't have affairs. (laughs) So we've had a moral conversion. And then the third one. You were always talking about spirituality and spiritual and spiritual. And I I used to say to myself, because I was very shy then. I I still am today. um, that, That spiritual sounds interesting. But see, I have religion. Do you know, for much of the first year, when I would go to an AA meeting, I could not go straight in the door. I had to go in sideways because I had flags in my ears. Catholic, Catholic, very, very Catholic. (laughs) So I had to go in sideways. And so we started talking about this. And you said to me, you know, Maurice, our program teaches us balance. And you helped me to get centered with my religion. I have the same religion that I was brought up with today. You gave me a wonderful technique to use. I use it with my religion, and I use it with many areas of my life. It's so helpful. Take what helps you and leave the rest. Hey, I thought everybody had a change for me to be okay. No. So I got centered with my religion. I said, well, okay, tell me about the spirituality. You said, well, it has to do with relationships. I said, you're kidding. You said, yeah, in three areas. Oh, what three? Relating to a higher power, relating to others, 
Oh, gosh, those are two I'm interested in. And you finish by saying, it also has to do with relating to self. And I got very sad. I said, I'll never have spirituality. There's nothing here to relate to. I'm a nothing. And you said, we'll help you get in touch. And you have taught me the full meaning of love your neighbor as yourself, not instead of yourself. You have taught me this above all. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.